What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about some other motivations or one other class of motivations for concurrency. And in this case, we're going to talk about how you can use concurrency to avoid having overly tangled, complicated software. So we're going to try to make something that's more structured as opposed to something that's a big ball of spaghetti. And we're going to use our download application again. OK, so if you were to go back and look at early generations of software, kind of like the early versions of Windows, the early versions of Mac, the early versions of Unix, and you were to look at how people wrote programs, you would see that those programs, by and large, were structured in a rather torturous way. And they were sort of like spaghetti. And the main reason for this was that they, were, they had to be written, because they didn't support threading in those days, they had to be written with what was called purely event-driven programming. And what that means is you typically end up having a message queue, and you have a single thread of control, and that single thread of control is used to process everything in the program. So user interface interactions, I.O. interactions, computations, whatever it is that's going on, it's done in one thread of control, and it's done in this single event loop. And for certain kinds of software, especially things that have to do a lot of interaction with I.O. devices, like you know, downloading stuff, like writing a server, for example, it's very hard to program things like that. And the reason for that is that single-threaded programs written in a purely event-driven model obscure the flow of control in both time and space. This is a little hard to get your head around. We'll see some code examples of this later, but right now we'll just sort of look at a diagram to try to get the point across. So the first thing to remember is that in these kinds of uh, event-driven event programs, long-duration operations that block, in other words, reading from a file or waiting on a semaphore or um, you know, some other thing, writing, writing to a file, things that take a long time to, to do work are not allowed to block to avoid starving everything else. That little hourglass was really saying, hey, everybody else is being starved at this point. right? You can't make any progress. So what they had to do, what you had to do in those days, is anything that would take a while to run, and sometimes you don't know, by the way, whether something will take a while to run. What would be an example of an operation where it's not really clear if it's going to run a long time or not? The, the factorial program where you dynamically enter what number you want. There you go. So you might, you know, if you give a small number, it might not take very long. If you give a big number, it may take a long time. What are some other things where uh, that one, at least in theory, you could sort of look at the size of the input and say, this is going to take a while. What would be some other examples where you don't really know ahead of time how long something's going to take? Getting information over a network. Getting information over a network. And what's the, what's the potential source of non-determinism? Uh, latency. So you don't really know if the network is overloaded. You don't really know if the server's overloaded. You don't know, you know, what, you know maybe you want to download something. You don't really know how big it is. So those are issues that make it non-deterministic. So anything that might take a long time to run actually has to be run asynchronously, not synchronously, by posting messages in the event loop's message queue. And the way this works is when you want to do something that's going to take a long time to run, like you want to start a read operation or start a write operation or whatever, you put a message in the queue and you say, you know, start this read and run it asynchronously. And then control immediately returns back to your event loop and you go off and do some other things, which may involve doing nothing, but at least you're not blocking anything. When that operation completes, then you get a message back saying the file has been read or the network uh, blocks have been read or whatever. And the processing in these things is decoupled in time and space. So these are actually going to be done at different points of time, obviously. And what's not quite so clear, but maybe you can see it from this diagram, is that this will actually be done in different parts of your program. If you look at your program, you'll have different handlers for different kinds of things, and those will be spread around in the code. So you can't look at one place in the code and go, oh, there's where it does that, because you have to be able to do the invocation, and that's separate from the completion handling. So we'll, when we see some code later on and you, we take a look at how content providers work, you'll get a really good feel for this. But for right now, you just have to take it on faith. There's a bunch of patterns for trying to minimize the complexity of this, but still you have to know the patterns and, and the problem still remains. Mercifully, with multi-threading, we don't have to do this stuff in quite the same way because it allows us to be able to structure the software in a more intuitive way. This, hence the whole point about things are, or the structure of the program is simplified. So all these modern operating environments like, like Android, for example, with Linux, gives you multi-threading abilities.
And what you can do here is you can have multiple threads per process, and you can even have multiple processes. And these threads can synchronously block. And we'll take a look and see what that means. Literally, we'll see it in a second. But what that means is if you are about to do an operation that may take a long time, and you're running in a separate thread of control, and there are other threads that can be used to run other things, then you can afford to block in a call, wait right there for something to complete, while other stuff is running in other threads. So the way that you write your program in multiple threads looks very, very much like you would write your program if you were writing a single threaded program and didn't care about blocking, which of course you do. But this allows you to write just sort of straight linear lines of code. And this leads a more natural, more cohesive control flow. Things are connected together in ways that are easier to understand by humans. And we'll see this in a second. OK. So let's take a look and see how this works. Android has these concurrency programs, concurrency frameworks that help you to do this. They allow you to be able to run long duration operations in background threads and short duration operations run in the user interface thread. You'll see it a lot before. And this helps you to write code that's less tangled, although you still got to know a bunch of patterns in order to do it right. The patterns are just a little different than if you were writing a purely event-driven program. And we'll come back and talk about some of these patterns in more detail. Uh, the other cool thing about doing this is it makes it much more easy to parallelize things. If everything runs in one thread of control, there aren't many opportunities at the user level for having things take advantage of multi-core. Because there's only one thing that can ever go on, right? Whereas if you start running in an environment with multi-core and you can use multiple threads, then the user level activities, the user level code, user level services, and so on, can actually run concurrently, and you can control it by the way you program your software. <clears throat> and naturally, you need to do a bunch of patterns, which we'll talk about. All right, so let's take a look at some code to illustrate this stuff. This is our, our download code, uh, download activity uh, code we saw before. And it's going to use the hammer framework from Android, which in turn uses the command processor pattern. We don't have to worry about the command processor pattern right now, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. All right, so let's take a look at the code. Here is a little snippet of code. Uh, and the cool part about this, by the way, what's really cool about this is I can show you pretty much all the code that is interesting here in just a handful of lines, demonstrating the cohesiveness in time and space of the solution relative to the event-driven, the purely event-driven approach. So here's how this would work. And you can download code that looks kind of like this if you go to this link. So we have a, an onDownload method which is what's going to get called back, much like your show location uh, method got called back when we did the map app. And this is going to be called when you click you know, download image or whatever. And this thing, as you can see, this function creates a new runnable, which is a command in the command processor pattern. And that runnable, which we create here, is then passed as a parameter to a new worker thread, which we're going to then start. So when we create this runnable, and we'll look more at the runnable in a second, that runnable gets passed to the thread and we start the thread. Yes, Lawrence? I thought that in Java, runnable is an interface and therefore isn't implementable. Runnable, in fact, is an interface, except what we're doing here is we're implementing what's known as an anonymous inner class. So what we're doing is we're coming along, we're saying new runnable, and then through the magic of, of Java, we're defining its run hook method in C2, right? We're not defining a separate class called download runnable or something like that. This is one of the cool things you can do with Java. This is used all over the place in Android. And in fact, once you get used to this idiom, the anonymous inner class idiom, when you go back to C++, you're kind of frustrated because it doesn't work quite the same way. It's not quite as cool. C++ has a lot of really cool stuff, but this isn't quite one of the things you can do. So we're actually defining a new runnable which is just, an, it's anonymous. We don't give it a name. It's not like download runnable. It's an instance that's an anonymous instance of an inner class. And it defines a run method which will go ahead and block synchronously because it's run in the thread that was started here. So when this thread is started, it'll go ahead and it will run the run method in the runnable command that we passed it. And that will then block in download image. 
And when download an image is finished downloading the image, it'll give you back a bitmap. And then we create another runnable. And that runnable will be passed to the user interface thread. Keep in mind, this runnable here was running in a background worker thread. Now we're going to create another runnable command, which we pass to the user interface thread. And when that guy's run method gets called, it'll be running in the user interface thread's context. And it'll turn around and set the image bitmap to the, the object that was passed to it through the magic of the final keyword in, in Java. So a bunch of interesting things here. The most interesting thing, going back to the earlier discussion about simplifying program structure, is notice how cohesive this is in time and space. right? In terms of, in terms of space, everything to do this that's interesting is all right here, literally right next to each other in the code. Right? So if you want to see where the blocking gets done, it's done right there. If you want to see where the thread gets created, it's get created right there. If you want to see what's running in that thread, it's right there. If you want to see the command that's passed to the user interface thread, it's all right there. So it's all right here, spatially located. And then in terms of time, this guy just blocks. We don't start some download operation and then come back at some point in time and get the result of the download operation thereby splitting those things in time. That's blocking in on the call stack of the, the worker thread. So arguably, your program is simpler. And one of the really cool things about the frameworks is it really probably is simpler, as we'll see later on. OK, so what's simple is that these operations become blocking, whereas otherwise they'd have to be non-blocking. And in contrast, the event-driven solution splits or decouples invocations from responses in both time and space. So the, the code is strewn around. Now, it turns out in Android, for this kind of stuff, there really is no way to do this asynchronously. You really can't do an asynchronous network read in Android without you know, diving way further down in the stack than we want to show here. That's why we'll look later at content providers as an illustration of how this would work. So later in the, in the uh, sections, we'll talk about how multi-threading works in Java. And we'll also talk about how it works in Android. And then we'll also talk about other ways of doing programming using content providers, which is pretty cool. OK, before I stop, though, is, are there any questions about, about this, this issue, right? Why this is, quote, simpler? Robbie. So you're talking about here? No, no, so further up. So oh. Yeah, so like what happens oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, so what you'd end up having to do, so the question here is um, image view is set to final somewhere up there. Uh, but that's, that's not always possible to do that. So what you do in that case is you'd make iView be non-final, and then you'd have to capture it in a final thing here before you, you used it in the context there. There's a lot of clever tricks. You'll see lots and lots of this stuff when you start looking at the, the sample code that we give you as part of the, the shells and skeletons for the assignments and looking at other code. The use of final, it turns out to be very important. And the great part is if you forget that you need final, the compiler will tell you it won't work until you put final in there. So you'll get used to using final after a while. Final has some other interesting characteristics we'll talk about later. OK. Any questions about that? So that's why the claim I'm making here is that multi-threading can simplify your program structure. Now, you may still have other complexities related to threading, and that's what we're going to start talking about next. But program structure will hopefully be less complicated.